Okay, so um, so this is a, a much more diverse audience for me than usual. Um, so I, I hear that they're mathematicians, um, they're physicists, and um, they're neuroscientists and other biologists in the audience. And um, so I just wanted to sort of um, lay out some of the, I, I do hear feedback now. Yeah, so let me just try switching this off and see if, um, yeah. Is it my, it's actually when I turn, oh. It's still on. Okay, it's on still. Okay, so I just wanted to sort of sketch out. It's not on? It says it's on. So I just wanted to sort of sketch out. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, so I want to sketch out. I want to sketch out sort of what I would, you know, wish for you to take away um, sort of on the very high level, independent of any of the details of what I'm telling you about. Um, I'd like you to take away about sort of the, the, the endeavor of theoretical neuroscience. And um, I would hope for the mathematicians in the audience, that um, you'll take away that um, this is a field, uh, it's one example of a field in which um, some of the, the power and the elegance of mathematics can be, can be really used, and in which maybe uh, the field itself can inspire some powerful and elegant new mathematics as well. Okay? And for the physicists in the audience, um, I would hope that you might agree that theoretical neuroscience is really not that much different from theoretical physics um, in its, uh, in its uh, techniques in the questions that we ask and um, in sort of the, just the general philosophy. Okay, and for the biologists in the audience, hopefully some of the things I'll tell you will illustrate that um, there is a role for theory um, in biology um, or neuroscience more specifically, and um, it's a role that goes beyond uh, the analysis of large data sets, right? It's, it goes beyond contributing tools to analyze big data. And so, so those are sort of the high level uh, aims that I hope will be achieved um, over the course of the talk. So sort of more um, concretely, um, what I'll talk about is um, I'll try to tell you three stories. I think it's very unlikely I'll make it to the third one. So most likely I'll just make it to the first two. So in the first story I want to tell you, I want to um, sort of set out um, a, a classical theoretical idea um, for, um, for memory in, in the brain. And, um, and, uh, and I'll talk about how that idea has been around for a long time and it's been sort of at the level of an analogy that um, is widely used, but uh, you know, the, the, the hope in theoretical neuroscience is to start to go more and more away from analogy and more and more towards very concrete and quantitative statements about what's happening in the neural systems. Okay, the second story I want to tell you is about um, um, coding um, in, in, in neural systems in the presence of noise and how it's possible for neural systems to be able to perhaps deal with noise and nevertheless perform accurate computation. And there I would like to assert that you know, our understanding of neural codes is really very rudimentary at this moment. And um, you know, it's, we've just barely begun to scratch the surface. And there's a lot of exciting avenues um, for what can be done in the field. OK, so um, uh, of course, uh, my talk is just a vignette of, 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 of a lot of stuff that's happened in neuroscience. Um, neuroscience has a relatively short history. But I would say already in its very short history, um, theoretical neuroscience has contributed a lot of key ideas and concepts um, for how we think about that sort of pervade in many ways um, how we think about various parts of the brain, neurons and neural circuits. Okay, so just to name, this is a very, very biased and very, very um, idiosyncratic listing of some of the very important contributions that theorists have made um, uh, in, in classical neuroscience. Uh, uh, it ranges all the way from cable theory, how you know, um, voltage propagates within uh, single uh, uh, neurons through the, through the dendritic and axonal processes. Um, Hodgkin Huxley described uh, spiking dynamics, the quantal theory of synaptic uh, uh, communication, vesicle release, and synapses, and so on, all the way up to um, uh, the theories about circuits and how it is that um, entire circuits can form beautiful patterns of activity, and neurons can have very beautifully tuned responses to external stimuli. All of these um, are, 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 are um, works have contributed to our understanding of sort of aggregate behavior in um, big neural circuits and um, really form part of the vocabulary of how we talk when we talk about neural systems. And um, so sort of in my view of theoretical neuroscience, theoretical neuroscience is, um, you know, it's, um, it's, 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 uh, uh, provides conceptual framework but with precise mathematical backing. And um, the advantage of this kind of math ma mathematical models of the brain is that um, they can, they're definite enough that they might be wrong. Okay, and I think being wrong 
um, in neuroscience at this stage in biology has as much value as being right because it lets you understand whether the principle you're espousing is the principle under which the system's operating or not. Okay, so um, it's not a pejorative thing uh, in neuroscience to be wrong in theory. Okay, so to actually begin, what I'm really going to talk to you about, um, I just want to start with a very basic observation. And the observation is that uh, neural transmission, the very fundamental component of neural computation, is, is noisy. Okay, so this is a picture of a synapse. Um, and every time a neuron spikes, an action potential, so it, it, it has, there's a catas cataclysmic event, the action potential, um, it invades uh, the presynaptic end of this, uh, of the, of this, uh, of this terminal. Uh, the synapse and uh, vesicles, these, uh, these little membrane sacs um, which contain neurotransmitters, uh, a vesicle is released, the neurotransmitter is released and signals to the next neuron that uh, an action potential happened in, in the presynaptic neuron. Okay, and this process of release is itself uh, stochastic, it's probabilistic. So even if there was a spike in the presynaptic neuron, um, a vesicle may or may not uh, be released. Okay, so that process is fundamentally probabilistic and, and therefore noisy. Okay, this is, a, uh, this is showing that cortical spiking itself also has a lot of variability in it. I still feel a lot of feedback. Um, so cortical, spi uh, cortical spiking has a lot of um, uh, variability. So this is multiple uh, repetitions of a single stimulus that are presented uh, to um, an animal. And um, as the animal uh, responds, these are multiple presentations, these are multiple spike trains. Uh, if the, the coefficient of variance of the response is analyzed, uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, something that's actually close to one, so it's it's as variable um, or even more so um, than a than a, a Poisson process. Okay, so uh, these very basic units of neural computation um, are stochastic. Okay, and um, given that the brain is responsible for accumulating information, accumulating evidence, and computing on it, and then making decisions and taking actions, uh, you know, noise can be quite problematic. Okay, so noise is especially problematic when the computation that's being performed is not just a representation of an external variable, but when it's a recursive computation. Okay, so um, in other words, when um, the computation uh, uh, involves building on a previous estimate that's already stored in the brain, um, and then building on it some more, the, the noise can propagate and add up and accumulate. Okay, so one specific example of, of an incremental um, operation is uh, integration, okay, in the sense of calculus. So um, integration involves two, two components. There's an increment component where there's an input to the integrator, then the system has to respond linearly to the input, okay, has to uh, increment its state. And then there's a second component of integration, which is memory, okay? So in the absence of an input or when the input is zero, then the system has to hold on to the state um, uh, that, it, that it had, okay, over that period of time when the input is zero. Okay, so integration really involves a memory in addition to an increment step, okay? And um, again, just as I said before, errors in each time step can accrue over time. And, um, and in fact, if the, if the estimate is over some bounded range, but, th but the noise can still add up, um, it can actually swamp the estimate. And um, nevertheless, yeah? Can you tell what the integration means? Uh, yes, integration is uh, just in the sense of calculus, that's all. So for example, suppose, uh, and I'll, give this as, I'll use this as an example even later in the talk, you, I'm walking around this room. Okay, and even if my eyes are closed, I have a sense, I have an estimate of how much distance I've traveled. I have an estimate of how far I am from the podium. Okay, so that's a specific example where um, we have a navigation system that allows us to increment our estimate of our location even as we move through space. We, we integrate things, all, all kinds of variables, okay? So there's a sense in which you integrate um, a lot of data um, to, um, to make a decision. So um, there's a common task where animals are shown dots that are moving either rightward or leftward, but a large fraction of the dots are actually just moving randomly in both directions. And um, in the task, the aim is to stare at those dots long enough until you're relatively sure that um, um, a small set of the dots are coherently moving in one direction or the other, and you have to press the button left or right. Okay, and if you have the chance to integrate over some time, then it's possible to make a more accurate decision, especially when the random moving dots are large in number. Okay, so that's an example where you've integrated this motion, this, other, this motion cue again. Okay, as you move your head around, left and right, um, your eyes counter-rotate exactly to cancel that motion. And um, so you can try that, try it. So, so <laughs> look at your hand, okay, and, and move your head about, and you'll see that your eyes counter-rotate well enough that you can see all the creases in your hand. Okay, now try the opposite version. 
Okay, hold your hand in front of your, uh, your face. Okay, and now move your hand. Can you see the creases on your, ha on your hand? You can't, okay? <laughs> but you can if you have an equivalent amount of motion with your head, okay? And the reason that you can nevertheless perceive very accurately the image of your hand when you're moving your head is because the vestibular signals from your ear are then integrated, okay, and they're conveyed to the ocular motor system that then counter-rotates your eyes in a way to keep your gaze still, even though your head is moving. Okay, so there are many, many ways in which the brain performs integration. It's literally, it's nothing mysterious, it's just integration in the sense of calculus. Uh, yeah? I'm sorry, where? Well, in, in the case of my mo moving, right, and having nevertheless an estimate of where I am, even if I did it with my eyes closed, the function that's being integrated is my velocity as a, as a function of time, right? In this case, it's my head velocity as a function of time. Yeah. Yeah. It, I don't have a handheld mic, but this one is on. That's off. Yeah, it, it's, it's bad, right? The audio is bad. OK, Let, let's have a vote. How many of you vote that I turn off this microphone? A large, OK. And how many of you vote that I keep it on? OK, so. The yeas have it. I'm going to keep it on. OK, so um, here's, here's this example, right? So this is an example of, this is, um, this is a turntable. This uh, in black is the trajectory of an animal, OK? This is its home base. It's like a lazy Susan. It comes out. Uh, it runs around foraging for food. And then once, this is a mouse. And then once it's found its food, you know, these mice don't like being exposed. And so what it wants to do, it wants to run back, run back to its home base um, to consume it. And um, in this example, it's, it's, it's come out on this um, outgoing pad that's a bit uh, uh, curved, and uh, these holes are all under under the under the level of the tables. It can't see them from from above. Okay, so it really is using um, uh, its estimate. It's added up all these little vector displacements um, to compute um, the total net displacement vector, and then it uses that net displacement vector to find the straight straight line path home. This is called homing. Okay, so this is a behavior which all all mammals are capable and um, also many insects that have a fixed home base and they go out to forage. In fact, um, many ants are capable of extremely prodigious kinds of um, integration. This is called path integration in biology. It's integration of a path. But uh, it, it's not path integration for that, that you call path integration in physics. OK, so, the, but, um, so, so, so this is pretty accurate behavior. And um, even though there's noise and noise accumulating and all the elements uh, that are performing the computation. Okay? So um, this recursive, uh, recursive computations do pose a challenge when there's noise in the system. And the question is, how is it possible to have accurate behavior in, in the presence of such a noise? Okay, so um, here are the overall questions that sort of motivate um, uh, the topics that I'm going to tell you about. Uh, one is a question about capacity and persistence of short-term memory in the brain. Um, neural integration, how does the brain perform neural integration, uh, do this kind of integration. Uh, what are the effects of noise um, on, on representation, computation, and memory in the brain? And, um, and um, my uh, uh, real interest uh, at, at, at the moment is on neural codes and the intersection of how dynamics affect codes and how codes affect dynamics. And, and I hope some of these uh, motivations will become clear um, as I tell you a little bit about, um, about uh, uh, some of the work we've done. OK, so let's start with a few observations um, on representation and storage uh, with a set of n neurons um, in the brain. So what I've depicted here is I've depicted uh, the state space or the representation space for a set of three neurons. Here's uh, the firing rate of neuron 1, the firing rate of neuron 2, and the firing rate of neuron 3 are depicted on these axes. So these go from, say, 0 to some maximum spiking rate, R max, on each axis. OK? And um, so this is sort of the space. If, 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 if neuron 1 is active at some uh, firing rate, and neuron 2 at another, and neuron 3 at another, um, then that uh, level of activity would be represented by a point in the space. OK? So this is a state space. OK? So, um, right, so this is um, this nice end. So if they're n neurons, it's a nice n-dimensional state space. Um, but uh, what about representations in the state space? So, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a large number of states. So if we were imagining that the firing rate of each neuron is, um, is discretized, so one can only you know, uh, differentiate 
some k levels of firing or q levels of firing, um, say q levels of firing per neuron, then there would be, if there are n neurons, there would be q to the n different states. It's a large capacity, a large amount of state space, a representational space. Okay, but the problem with the representational space is that um, there is no memory. So for example, if you put a system, an, uh, a system of n uncoupled neurons, okay, and you put them in a certain state, then within just a few tens or hundred milliseconds, that state's gonna decay back um, to zero. Okay, so neurons cannot hold on. They do not have memory. Um, the, their activity does not persist for any length of time um, in, uh, on its own. Okay, so if you initialize the system in some state, it just decays back um, to the origin. Okay, and moreover, if you map each of these states, um, this, this large uh, set of states, um, into you know, the values of some variable, the problem is if there's any noise in this representation or an external input comes and you know, causes some perturbation of the, of the representation, uh, there's no tolerance to noise. There's no correction of any kind. It, uh, you've now suddenly are knocked into a different part of the representation space, and there's, there's no recovery from noise. Now, what can we do, okay? What does the brain do? Well, uh, let's just make another simple observation, which is that if neurons are connected to each other, you allow them to interact and maybe excite each other or inhibit each other and so on, um, connections induce correlation, okay? They induce dependencies. So neurons that are connected will tend to become, for example, if they're strongly exciting each other, they'll tend to be more coactive, okay? So now, suddenly, a pair of neurons that are strongly connected must be coactive, and um, you've restricted the independence of those two neurons by adding the connection between them. Okay, so in general, adding connections between neurons reduces the amount of state space that's available for the representation, okay? But with special uh, forms of connectivity, special types of connectivity, it's possible to create um, these special points in the state space uh, called fixed points, okay? And these fixed points are stable states of the system, of the dynamics, okay? And uh, so, for example, the Hopfield network that some of you have probably heard about um, are, is, is, um, uh, it's one of the um, um, foundational works in uh, computational neuroscience. It gives a simple rule um, for the creation of, for, for synaptic change that leads to the creation of very specific fixed points in the system. Okay, so it's a way to build in specific fixed points um, using very simple and plausible um, learning rules. Okay, so, um, and, and those rules, Okay, so a fixed point is um, a fixed point in the dynamical system sense. It means that if you initialize... So, so this is the state space. So this is um, you know, the activity of one neuron, activity of the second, activity of third. And what this is showing is that um, if you uh, put the system in, in, a, in, in the state, okay, this, this particular state, which is you make neuron one fire at this rate, R1, neuron two fire at rate, R2, and three fire at rate, um, neuron three fire at rate, R3, the system will stay there, okay, in the absence of perturbation. And moreover, if there is a perturbation, the system will continue to stay there as long as the, it, it, if you make a perturbation that's small, it'll decay back to that fixed point, okay, as long as the perturbation is smaller than the distance of half the distance between these two points. Okay, if the perturbation is bigger, then it's gonna flow into the next fixed point. Okay, so that, it's, it's, it's a fixed point in that sense, yeah. Um, are the dynamics being described by a Poisson point process with is these rates? Okay, so at this point it's a bit abstract. Okay, all I'm saying is that if you have um, a certain kinds of coupling between neurons, it's possible to create um, a few fixed points, okay, that are stable. That's all I'm saying. I, I haven't talked about any specific model of neurons or anything. But, okay? I, but I think even in your abstract dis description, I'm not understanding what is, what is the, the, the dynamics in this picture? Um, okay, yes, so in this picture you may think of individual neurons as just having um, a very simple linear differential equation that describes their activity, where it's just the exponential decay over time in the absence of an input. I see. Okay, and then in, in, in addition, then they have a coupling term uh, uh, okay, so, so they interact uh, with each other and they drive each other um, uh, and so there's an additive term that with some appropriate weighting and maybe a nonlinearity in front, um, which, yeah, there would be in this case, yeah. But these are really rates, no stochasticity. These are rates. This is no stochasticity at, the, at this point. That's right. Okay, so, so I'm just making some very abstract high-level um, point. So what I'm saying is, um, so, so what does this mean? So if you create stable fixed points, one thing that you get, what do you buy? What does that buy you? Well, it buys you persistent states, right? So suddenly you have these units that are not individually persistent, that cannot hold a state for any length of time, but now by creating stable fixed points, you've got states that can hold, that can stay there for, for a while, 
So if, if you were to map now each of these states to the value of some external variable, okay, so then it's possible to have memories for those external variables. Okay, so if, there, if you were able to create this mapping, then it's possible to have um, now these memories for these external variables. Okay, the other advantage of creating these fixed points is, as I just briefly mentioned, um, you can get um, some noise tolerance. So there's a degree of noise tolerance, so small perturbations um, uh, uh, do not knock the system far away from this, uh, from this fixed point. In fact, those perturbations decay back um, to the fixed points. Okay, so you, get, you, get, you buy a memory where you never had one before, and you buy yourself um, some tolerance uh, to noise. Okay, so this is called um, attractive dynamics, uh, and this is a case of, of discrete, discrete attractors. Now, what if the aim is to construct a memory for some analog variables? Okay, so suppose one wants to remember the values of some analog variable, um, then perhaps uh, uh, the brain might construct um, a set of fixed points that are uh, also along some continuum. Okay, so there is hypothesized that the brain might stabilize um, continuous sets of these fixed points to store continuous variables. Okay, so, so this, um, this is a, a, a case of their end neurons, and there's this one-dimensional ring that's a set of fixed points, and this is a one-dimensional um, continuous attractor. Okay, and um, now this one has some of the properties. So once again, uh, the states on this, uh, on this ring persist. In the absence of any noise, if you initialize the system anywhere on this ring, uh, the system will stay there. Okay, but in the presence uh, of perturbation away from the ring, those uh, perturbations, again, decay back okay, to the fixed points. So there's some degree of error correction um, on this ring. Okay? Uh, now, the, the errors are not perfectly corrected because if there's a component of uh, the perturbation that's parallel to the ring, that component cannot be corrected. Okay? But nevertheless, if this is a one-dimensional ring and this is an n-dimensional space, then at least n minus one of the dimensions of the noise um, can be corrected, and one of the dimensions of the noise um, is not. Okay, so these kinds of structures are um, now widely hypothesized uh, to be to be present in the brain, and they might they're also hypothesized to play a role in uh, functions like integration. Okay, so imagine that the variable that's being represented is um, is the is the angle of my head. Okay, so different angles of my head would correspond to different states on this ring. Okay, now suppose head velocity as an input could come in and push the system along this ring. Okay, and suppose that the velocity signal pushes the system along the ring in proportion to the, to the speed, okay, of movement, uh, and for the entire duration of the movement. Well, now the new state of the system, wherever it is on this ring, uh, represents the integral of that velocity. Okay, so um, conceptually, this is how uh, integrators, neural integrators of analog variables, are hypothesized to work. Okay, so you've got um, a continuum of fixed points that represents different values of, say, head, um, head angle, or eye angle, and um, velocity inputs come in and and um, and move the state along this continuum of fixed points. So the state, when solved with just a bunch of discrete fixed points, yes. that's sort of very generic. That's right. It's highly non-generic. That's right. Yes, I mean, so so that's supposed to be the third part of my story, which I'm very skeptical that I'll reach. And so yes, so that's that's one of the one of the big questions is you know how is it possible to build in the symmetries and um, structures that are uh, required to support these kinds of rings? And I, I think you know we have a partial um, a model for this, but I think really on a deep level understanding how to. Um, build in and preserve the symmetries to at the at the level of tuning that's required to really stabilize these states. I think it's still very much an open question. Okay, but the first thing I want to talk to you about is to um, to to say that these pictures that I'm making here um, are abstract, but um, there are some neural correlates that uh, for for these pictures that suggest that these pictures may be more than just cartoons. Okay, so I want to first try to convince you of that. Okay, so it's been very abstract, okay, and um, like, like many of you have noticed. Um, so the question is, what's an example of how a network of n neurons can generate um, a, a low dimensional continuous attractor uh, network? Okay, so suppose I'm allowed to specify um, connections between neurons as I, as I, as I would like. Um, what is an example of a system that has this uh, continuum of fixed points? Okay, so let's, let's take a set of n neurons and let's arrange them 
um, on a ring. Okay, so let's just arrange them in, in, in this ring. And let's assume the following connectivity. Let's suppose that neurons right next to each other excite one another. And let's assume that neurons further apart uh, from, and, and, and then this neuron also inhibits all the neurons further away from it. Okay, and the same connectivity is true for every neuron on the ring. So this neuron excites its neighbors and inhibits every, everyone else, and the next neuron does the same thing, and so on. Okay, so with this connectivity, um, what, what happens? Okay, so if a neuron, um, so this is now the activity space of two neurons, okay, so this is the same state space picture that I was showing earlier, the abstract state space picture. So this connectivity, if it's strong enough, it destabilizes what's called the uniform mode, right? So it's no longer possible for all neurons to be approximately equally active. So if this one neuron received slightly higher than average activity just from noise, um, what it does is it excites its immediate neighbors, which also excite it. So it's a positive feedback process. Okay, in addition, because these neurons are getting quite active, um, they're quite successful in suppressing their further away neighbors. Okay, so what has in the end been stabilized um, is this bump of activation. Okay, so in red I'm showing you an example of the firing rate profile of these neurons that are arranged in this ring. So uh, these neurons that excite each other um, are highly activated and they effectively suppress um, the activity of all the other neurons in this ring. Okay, so it's one local hill or bump of activation. Okay, so let's uh, then um, label uh, that state, uh, oh, I'm sorry, so why is it going this way? Okay, yeah, so let's, um, so let's label uh, this bump location as theta. Now, of course, there's nothing special about the bump being at this location, okay, because each neuron has exactly the same profile of connectivity as, as that neuron over here. So the bump can very equivalently, instead of being centered at theta, can be centered at this other uh, neuron labeled theta prime. Okay, so um, this bump state is stable, but so is the blue one. Okay, now in the state space that corresponds to uh, one point here, theta, and this other point, theta prime. And in fact, all translations of this bump, okay, in infinitesimal translations of this bump are equivalent fixed points or stable states. And so that's how it's possible to create um, a ring of fixed points um, uh, in a simple network of n neurons. Okay, so this is just a, a hardwired example of how this is. Okay, so now if we um, were to identify, okay, and here's an example of a pattern that's not stable. Okay, this is, um, you know, some activity pattern where all neurons are roughly equivalently active. Um, this is a pattern that's uh, not stable, and, um, and so that's represented by all the other gray space in this, in this activity space. Okay, so in the state space. So um, now if we were to map uh, an external variable uh, that has uh, some angular coordinates onto different points on this ring, uh, then this ring of fixed points would correspond to um, a, a set of uh, possible memory states for, for remembering values of this continuous variable, like head direction. Okay, so this was um, work hypothesized about um, a couple of decades ago, um, and it's called um, a ring network. Okay, so this is a hypothesized mechanism for short-term memory and for also orderly um, codes for representing um, things like head direction, for representing things like the orientation of, an, of, of a bar in the visual world. Um, the model, again, is that um, neurons respond according to these, these nice bump-like activity shapes and they stabilize each other um, through their interconnections. Okay, so these kinds of theories, so hop field theories of discrete attractors for you know, memories, for discrete memories, and these kinds of continuous attractor network uh, models have been around um, for a long time. Okay, so discrete networks, uh, hop field networks were proposed three decades ago, continuous attractor models were proposed um, two decades ago. And they really, really served as powerful analogies, okay, that parade how we talk about short-term memory, about circuits for neural integration um, uh, in the brain. But it's been very difficult to really substantiate um, and, and test this hypothesis, okay? So, um, and I think for everybody who cares really about, you know, what really is underlying um, how the brain performs short-term memory, that's a bit problematic, okay? So, um, until we can really quantitatively um, demonstrate that the brain has, uh, possesses, and, and uses low-dimensional continuous attractor dynamics um, in its memory or integration functions, um, we're gonna be stuck at this level of analogy. Okay, so what are examples of hypothesized um, continuous attractor systems? Uh, there's no shortage of hypothesized um, continuous attractor systems. Uh, specifically, one is uh, this uh, example that I uh, mentioned on um, orientation tuning in the visual cortex. Uh, bars of different angles uh, in the visual world provoke responses. Um, a bar of a certain orientation provokes a maximal response in a given neuron, and this neuron will fire, for example, 
with different firing rates, this is firing rate as a function of the angle of the stimulus in the visual scene, it'll fire um, at different rates depending on the angle of the stimulus, and it'll have a maximal firing um, location. And different cells will have a different angle at which they fire maximally. Okay. This is an example of um, a head direction cell. So these are cells that fire when the head is facing a certain, uh, is at a certain angular direction. Okay, so these are, again, neurons that have very similar tuning to these orientation tuned cells in visual cortex, but these are cells that are tuned to the direction of the head in, 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 in relative to the um, um, external world. Okay, and finally, these are ocular motor neurons. These are the neurons that control the, the direction of gaze, the horizontal angular deflection of the eye um, as you look around. And, and these neurons, too, are hypothesized to be examples of, um, of cells that are participating in this low dimensional continuous attractor um, system. Okay, and so for various reasons, these systems, yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so that's, a great, that's a great question. And so in fact, um, one of the early attractor models was, uh, you know, this, uh, one, of the, one of the early models for continuous attractor dynamics was for the visual system, but there are various reasons for why that's quite controversial, and I think I agree with you. It's likely that the visual system does not have continuous attractor dynamics. Okay, so in fact, I was just gonna say that, that the evidence is much stronger that these two systems are continuous attractor um, systems. And these are both neural integrators. This is an example of, of the head direction integrator that integrates head velocity and returns head direction. This is an integrator that takes um, eye velocity and eye movement commands and then produce signals to keep the eye contracted at the appropriate location, okay? And, and these systems do have persistent activity. They have to have memory because they're integrators. Okay, so now for various reasons, it's been difficult. Um, it's been difficult to completely characterize um, uh, the low dimensionality of the response of these systems. Okay, so, so the are that's right. Each of these lines is a different neuron. Okay, so it's a it's a plot of the position of the eye as a function of the firing rate of the neuron. And so if you if you were to plot just the firing rate of neuron one versus the firing rate of neuron two with eye position as an intermediary variable. Okay, then you would find that they would lie on, on one line. Okay, so then you can see that, um, it's, uh, that they lie on a, on a low dimensional uh, manifold. But, but really rigorously um, quantifying this for various reasons has been, uh, has been a bit difficult. Yeah, is there any question? I thought that, okay, all right, so, um, so, so, so these systems, um, I think the two integrators um, are the most compelling examples so far. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to try to answer this question as definitively as possible so that we can then proceed from theories and analogy um, to just a more quantitative understanding of how neural systems function. Okay, and so this brings me to this fascinating set of cells um, that are called uh, grid cells. Okay, so what are grid cells? Grid cells are cells that live in a particular uh, part of the brain called the entorhinal cortex. It's a cortical area. This is uh, shown here is the spiking activity. Each dot, each red dot is one spike, okay? And all of these spikes are from one individual cell. One single cell has emitted all of these spikes. And what you're seeing in black is, um, is the trajectory of an animal as it's traversing or running through and exploring this square enclosure, okay? It's a one meter by one meter enclosure. The animal's running around on this black path and as the animal runs around, the cell emits uh, spikes. And I think you can all probably see uh, that these spikes are not arranged at random, but um, they have these areas of density, and these, um, these areas of high density spiking are arranged on the vertex of a regular triangular lattice. Okay, so these are absolutely fascinating uh, neurons, and uh, for obvious reasons, uh, they're called grid cells. So it's exactly, it's a regular, it's a regular triangular lattice, uh, equilateral. Okay, so. So just, just to interpret this picture, right? So this is a two-dimensional space representing. This is a two-dimensional space, it's the floor, okay, Literally. of a box, and the animal's running around in the box, and then black is its trajectory, mm -hmm. and every time the animal reaches this location in the box, say, it fires a spike. Uh, and, and it tends to fire a lot of spikes here, 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 so here, points. and so on. Those and are these are lattice points. points. This, this is a virtual equilateral triangle triangular lattice, and, and, and the cell knows somehow whenever the animal reaches one of these virtual vertices, and it emits spikes at that point. Is this scale of size? Yeah, that's a great question. The answer is no. So in, in, in boxes of different sizes, the, the, peri the period of the lattice is invariant. 
Okay, except under very special circumstances, which I'll get to later. But yes, it's, it tends to be invariant, and uh, so it's intrinsically determined, the period. Yeah, so this is an absolutely fascinating example of a cell. The reason I bring this up in the question in the context of continuous attractors is that these cells, grid cells, are believed to be the neural substrate, the basis for our ability to do integration in 2D as we move around in space. Okay, so these cells will continue even in the dark. If you switch out the lights, the, the, the cell and the animal continues to walk around the enclosure. It will tend to fire spikes at the appropriate locations on the vertices of this lattice, okay? Which means that it's not relying on visual cues to be able to know where it is in space. Okay, so there's, and there's other streams of evidence based on lesion and damaging parts of the brain that the system is involved in this process of con uh, 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 turning self-motion estimates into estimates of location in an ongoing way. Yeah? Yeah, these are stellate cells. Yes. Uh, what animals can you see? Yeah, so it's, it's basically ubiquitous in the, in the mammals um, that have been studied. They were first found in rats, and they were then found in um, mice and bats, and um, now most recently, through earlier through fMRI, but now through electrophysiology, they've also been found in humans. So any mammal that has been studied has these grid cells. It's always an equilateral triangular lattice. So they can look at different neurons and the spacing of the lattice can be Yes, different. yes, so okay, so that's the next slide. And so um, if you look at any group of cells, if you put in one wire and look at the cells in, that, in one neighborhood, they tend to share a very similar spatial period and they also share a very similar spatial orientation. Okay, but if you look, um, this, this is the, the area, the entorhinal cortex. Um, this is about, um, this is um, uh, uh, several millimeters. And if you move several millimeters away, then if you record cells on one end of the strip, they tend to have a lower period, and towards the ventral boundary of the strip, um, they have a larger period. Okay, and the periods um, do not span a very large uh, range. So the smallest period of the lattice is about th 0.3 meters, 30 centimeters, and the largest one is three meters, about one decade. It's not a huge range of scale. Okay, just for reference, the animals tend to move um, in a given day, I looked up pest control literature to see how far you know, rats forage. It's not, neuroscientists don't tell you this information. But um, yeah, they can forage up to one kilometer square per day looking for food. Okay, and a more typical number is like 100 meters uh, per, per linear dimension. So neither of these scales is, is similar to that, to that large scale. Okay, this is all much smaller periods than the scales over which they move. Okay, so what I'm gonna focus on it at first is I'm only gonna focus on a single network, okay? So this is, we're gonna, uh, there's, there's evidence and also there were theoretical predictions from um, uh, my lab and other groups um, that, that these networks should be discrete and, um, and, 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 and there should be a discrete set of periods, not a continuum of periods, and that seems to be true experimentally speaking. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna focus on one network, by which I mean cells in one small neighborhood of each other. Okay, we're gonna examine whether these cells exhibit continuous attractor dynamics. Now the reason to look at continuous attractor dynamics in the context of grid cells is because they're thought to be involved in integration, therefore the, they must um, perform a memory function if they do. Um, and the second reason to focus on grid cells is that it's possible to induce some very interesting deformations of the response. And the question is, under those deformations too, is the system still lying on the same low dimensional attractor or not? Okay, and so that's the motivation for looking at these. Okay, so the simplest thing you, want to, you can do is if you want to look at whether uh, a set of neurons, uh, the responses lie on a low-dimensional attractor, is let's just plot the state-space picture. Let's just plot the activity of one neuron against another and see whether they lie on a low-dimensional manifold, right? If two neurons, their activities just lie on a line, well, you know, it's a one-dimensional manifold um, uh, that, that, they, that they tend to sit on. So this is actually um, uh, uh, just a model of these grid cells, just simulated what, what, what they look like, these nice triangular patterns in space. Um, and I've just simulated you know, um, uh, locations along a line in space. Okay, so in this, in this model of grid cells, two grid cells, um, if, I look at, if I plot the deterministic firing rates of the cells, um, R1 and R2 with no noise, then this is what um, the, the relationship is between the firing of one neuron and the other, this red line. Okay, if I add a small amount of um, you know, noise into these neurons, so this is in the high signal to noise regime, these are Poisson neurons, they're firing Poisson spike trains, um, but their firing rates are extremely high, so the SNR is very high, then you get really um, this blue curve. 
okay, which you can see um, uh, has now made the picture a lot more complicated. But nevertheless, it might still be possible to see how um, that the, the, the blue responses are still on some lower dimensional manifold um, in, in, in space. Okay, but these are extremely high firing rates. Um, when I try to make the, the response much more uh, similar to the biology, okay, a low firing rate, then the SNR becomes, the signal to noise ratio becomes quite low, and you can see that, alas, it is very difficult to recover any um, um, manifold, low dimensional manifold structure, even though it exists, right? It's there. I put it in by hand. It's these nice lattice responses um, of these cells. And if you look at the data, um, the data, this is real data, of, uh, of uh, uh, taken from an animal as it moves in a 1D line um, in space along a 1D track. And you can see that the responses of cell one versus cell two really are very, very difficult to decipher. So under conditions of you know, realistic neural variability, or in fact real neural variability, it is very difficult to, to determine whether there's a low dimensional structure from a time series of responses. OK, and it's because of noise. And the problem is, how do you reduce the noise? You want to reduce the noise and filter it without filtering away the signal. OK, so that's, that's very tough. Now it turns out that for grid cells, um, we're in a nice situation because we know what these grid cells are coding for. We know that they code for space. Specifically, they're coding for x and y location of the animal, right? Or at least they respond to the location of the animal. That's how they fire. So this is the real spikes from um, cell one, real spiking of cell two. These are simultaneously recorded cells, OK? And so the trajectory, the path, the gray is the same in both of these cells. So one thing you can do to reduce the noise is we can um, plot the responses of these cells as a function of space, which is what we've done. Okay, as a function of location, you can see it's this nice grid-like response. And now we can parametrize the spatial tuning of the cells. Okay, so we can parametrize it by fitting a triangular lattice um, to each of these responses, and then we get parameters, right? Like the 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 you know the 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 length of the first unit vector for the for the lattice, and the length of the second one, and the ang the internal angle um, between them, and then the overall orientation phi of the lattice. Uh, and so there we have four parameters, and then there are two more that specify the xy shift. Okay, so six parameters then parameterize um, the whole lattice, and now with the parametric descri description of each neuron we can now ask whether the neurons are li lie on a, on a low-dimensional manifold or not. OK, so what are the predictions for low-dimensional um, attractor dynamics for, for, you know, for these parameters? What, what is it that we should expect? Well, let's go back to that ring network picture. OK, so what you expect in this ring network um, kind of picture is that two neurons um, should have, OK, so I should introduce the concept of something called a tuning curve. A tuning curve is once you've taken this, this manifold and you've mapped points on this manifold to values of this external variable that's being represented by those neurons. Okay, so there has to be this process of, of these states representing values of, a, of an external variable. Now what you do is you take a single neuron, measure its firing rate as you vary the value of the variable. Okay, and what you get out is the tuning curve of the neuron. Okay, so, so you get out a tuning curve of the neuron. So now the prediction from these kinds of models is that any pair of neurons within one continuous attractor network will have identical tuning curves, right? The shape will be identical, and they only will differ by um, shifts, okay, of the, of the phase. They'll have phase shifts, and they'll only differ in phase shifts. Okay, in the case of grid cells, it would be a two-dimensional phase shift, okay? In this case, it's a one-dimensional. So in the case of the grid cells, I shouldn't be, I should be drawing any surface. That's correct. You should draw a surface with many, bom you know, with many bumps or, you know, a single periodic um, bump that moves around. Uh, that's right. It's a surface of, of neurons. It's sheet. And so, yeah. So your, um, your state space here is just parametrizing these bumps. Uh, that's know, correct. So, so now my state space, exactly. So for each, for each, I've got a state space where there are six variables for each neuron, right? So uh, I've, got, uh, I've got, you know, this, the six uh, grid variables for, for each neuron, and they're n neurons. OK, so that it's still, it's, it's the state space that's, you know, it scales with the number of neurons. I think That's the whole state space. And I'm asking, is, is the system actually lying on this low-dimensional manifold? So the low-dimensional manifold is, is basically a torus that's reflecting this periodicity? Uh, right. So, okay, so what is the attractor manifold? It's, it's basically, it's, it's a population pattern, right? So this is, you look at the group of neurons together, and uh, only certain patterns and translations of the pattern are stable. Okay? So this is not the, the these are not the stable states. The, these tuning curves. These are the tuning curves of the neurons. And there's one more step in deriving tuning curves, right? You have to take these stable states and you've got to map them to an external variable. So the things that can change, the tuning curves themselves can change. 
Okay, the things that cannot change are the following, which is that the shapes should be remain identical no matter what happens uh, of, of different neurons. They should remain identical. The second thing that should remain unchanged is that if one neuron is active and it tends to be activated at the same time as another neuron, say these two neurons because they're in the bump, at the, they're, they're close by and so they're part of the same bump, they're active in phase, it, no matter what deformations you make in the tuning curve, they should nevertheless continue to be in phase. Okay, two neurons that are in counter phase, for example, that are lie you know, opposite sides of the ring, so they're, you know, the, when the bump is on one, then the activity in the other is suppressed, they're gonna be anti-correlated and their phase is gonna be opposite, and that should be true regardless of how you deform the lattice, this, this tuning curve. Okay, and that's the question. In fact, that's key, right? We wanna induce deformations in the response of the cell, of the system, induce as many perturbations as we can. We wanna see whether the system, nevertheless, these cells maintain these relationships with each other, that if they're coactive, they'll always be coactive. If they're exactly counter-phased, they'll be always counter-phased. And that's the prediction, and that's what we wanna check, okay? So, uh, here we assume that the cells are locally exciting each other, right? Um, in this case, they're locally exciting and then globally inhibiting. So is that physiologically evidence that they're inhibiting each other ah, locally? Uh, okay, so, so that's a whole other discussion, right? Like the mechanistic basis. So in this case, I just gave you one example, a very specific example of how it could be possible to get this set of activity states. Yes. Um, but I'm not, but I'm not holding you to it and I'm not holding myself to it. There, there could be alternative connectivities that can still stabilize these patterns. Okay, and we're only talking abstractly. We're talking about stability of a set of activity states, and I'm only gonna test that. I'm not testing any specific uh, model of connectivity. But so is now a six-dimensional surface that's stable, and you've just cleared an angle? Yeah, no, 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 no. So the, 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 the manifold, the attractor manifold is two-dimensional. So in this case, so let's just look at this ring attractor network, right? I've got um, these, these, these bumps that have these certain shapes. I could parameterize them by three variables, or four, or five, or seven. Okay, that, that doesn't correspond to the attractor dimension. The attractor dimension is just the shifts, okay? So, so the extended dimension of the attractor just corresponds to the shifts in these, um, of the bump. But only, only still a one dimension. Exactly, so it's a pattern and all rotations of the pattern. So in the grid cell case, it would be a sheet, a pattern and a sheet on a two-dimensional sheet and all translations of that pattern in the two-dimensional sheet. So it's a two-dimensional continuous attractor. Okay, so that's, that's the idea, right? So the pattern itself may have some detailed shape that may re require 20 parameters to parameterize. It's a two-dimensional attractor that corresponds to shifts of a canonical pattern. And in this case, it's a one-dimensional attractor with shifts of a one-dimensional canonical pattern, right? One-dimensional function that's being so that, shifted. So that two-dimensional surface is a torus reflecting the periodicity? Yeah, the two-dimensional surface is like, you, the, the, yeah, I mean, there are many ways that you can picture that two-dimensional surface. It could be, you could imagine a hexagonal pattern of bumps on a neural sheet. Okay, with, with aperiodic boundary conditions. Or you can imagine a single bump on, 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 an, on, an, on a neural sheet where the neuro, neural sheet has periodic boundary conditions. So then it would be a torus. It would be a single bump on a torus. Okay, so that's one way to think about the activity pattern. Another way to think of the activity pattern is um, it's a whole array of bumps on a triangular lattice in the pattern, and the pattern has aperiodic boundary conditions. Actually, it turns out there's a lot of very interesting different predictions that you can make about the periodic versus aperiodic network that I think can be tested. And that's also something that we're you know, working on with some collaborators to test whether the population activity pattern has one bump or many bumps. Um, so coming back to the grid cells, yeah. um, they are locally, we know that there are some evidence that they are uh, inhibiting each other. That's right. right. So is it, um, important to have this local excitation? No, so the excitation, it turns out, so, um, so um, my colleagues and I have a model for grid cells, in fact, one of the earlier models of grid cells that has no excitation in it at all. The only thing that's essential for these grid cell models, and we're getting a bit far afield, so I wanna cut this off right now soon, but mm. the only thing that's really required is, is local inhibition. So excitation is not necessary. Okay so, okay, so those are the predictions in the model, right? So the predictions are neurons should have identical tuning curves, up to two-dimensional phase shifts, okay? And secondly, all the, the relationships between neurons should be absolutely stable no matter what happens to the tuning curves of the cells. So what happens here? Okay, so I'm plotting the parameter ratio between pairs of cells for a, a, lar a fairly large number of recorded cells, and you can see that the ratio, so this is ratio of the parameter lambda one, okay, this length of that one um, 
first unit vector, um, uh, the ratio between a pair of cells, okay? So it should be close to one if it's the same parameter, if it's the same value for, the, for them. And this is for all the four parameters up to the phase shift. And you can see that these ratios are extremely um, uh, close to one, in fact, up to estimation um, um, uncertainty. And um, the, the phase shifts between cells, so this, this thing that I call delta is the relative phase or the difference in phase between pairs of cells, you can see that these are uniformly distributed as you would predict, okay? So you would predict a, a uniform distribution of the, of the phase um, between pairs of cells. Okay, so they're predicted to and do share identical tuning shapes and differ by um, uniformly distributed 2D shifts in phase. Now, what's interesting, uh, Yeah, in other words, all it means is that, you know, if you look at the tuning curves of two different cells, uh, they have the same uh, pattern of response, and the only difference between the two patterns of response is that um, the peaks lie at different locations. You just shift, rigid shift of that, of that, of that tuning curve. That's right. Okay, so now if we look at, okay, so what's interesting is that um, if you record from that set of cells, and then you put the animal in a different uh, environment for three hours, and then bring the animal back in, to the first environment, and then again record these parameters. Um, again, the parameter ratio between cells um, remains uh, close to one. It doesn't change, okay? So despite the gap uh, in measurement, the ratios, again, are close to one. Now, what's interesting is that um, if we consider the relative phases between cells, so two cells had a, a phase shift, okay, relative to each other. Now let's consider how stable are those phases after this period in time, okay? So what I'm plotting here is I'm plotting any changes over time in the relative phase of cells. If they're stable, they should be at zero. Okay, you can see that these are clustered around zero, and um, in fact, they're basically zero up to estimation uncertainty, which is given by this red um, circle here. Okay, so those dis distributions are identical, um, just the null, the, the null distribution where there are uh, zero uh, changes in the phase um, uh, versus the measured uh, ones in black. Okay, now what's, um, now you might say, well, okay, what about the stability of the phases themselves? Okay, this is a very open environment. There are a lot of landmarks around, so the animal certainly is able to um, see where it is, and perhaps these external cues are stabilizing the phases of the patterns of these tuning curves of the cells. So what we measured then is we measured um, the changes in the actual phases themselves of the individual cells, okay, in, in three hours later in the environment. So this is the change in the phase of a single cell after three hours, okay, rather than the relative phase. So what we saw is, once again, they tend to be you know, small changes, but now these changes are, are quite significantly different than the estimation error, okay? And um, you can see again here, this is the estimation error distribution, this is the, the true distribution. So, so these shifts, it means that a single cell, when the animal's put back in the same environment, is basically the same phase as it had earlier in the environment, but there are small but significant shifts. And those shifts really set, show you the limits of how much informational, uh, spatial information is, is there from these finite set of landmarks out there. Okay, so, what, so these give you the balance on how much external information is stabilizing the phases. And this, you can see the stabilization is a lot larger than what is possible from, from the external um, cues alone. Yeah. Uh, no, right? So, so that the point here is that the grid fields are stable, yes. but, but their phases have changed a little bit over time. Okay, but the relative phase, the relationship between pairs of cells, is far more stable than the responses of the single cells themselves. That's the key. The pairwise relationships are more stable than the responses of the single cells. Uh, well, it has some estimation error. Yeah. Yeah, that's precisely the point. Exactly. Uh, no, I, 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 well, I, no, um, what is stabilizing the relative phase 
beyond the external cues, right? The external cues can only stabilize the system this far, and the relative phases are stabilized more. In what? Yeah, this, that's the external cue. The question is, are the relationships? So it, that's right. So it's interesting to do the analysis for the relationship between pairs of cells in V1 um, when you repeat the stimulus, right? And I don't think that analysis has been done. But, but I think if the analysis is done and you see that the relationships between um, cell responses are more tightly conserved than the individual cell responses, I think that is evidence that the interactions between cells are stabilizing um, the relative responses. OK. so. Um, OK, so, so, that's, so the point is that the relative phases are more stable than the absolute phases of individual cells. And so that relative stability cannot be ascribed um, to the external cues alone. OK, so now there's another question, which is, um, OK, maybe there's another area in the brain. For example, um, these grid cells project to the hippocampus, an area that's famously involved in learning and memory, specifically in spatial representation. And um, it has these cells called place cells. So the question is, um, how about if you put the animals in a novel environment Okay, that they've never experienced before, they've never been in. So they do not, they're not familiar with the landmarks in the environment. They do not know how to relate the landmarks in the environment with spatial locations um, in the environment. Okay, so those things are unmapped. Now what happens in novel environments is that place cells um, often will, well, place cells will um, uh, undergo what's called total remapping. So the firing fields um, will move of individual place cells and moreover the relationships in the firing fields between place cells will scramble. So two cells that were coactive need not be coactive anymore, okay? And two cells that were not coactive before will become coactive. That's what's happening in place cells, okay? Um, that are receiving projections from the entorhinal cortex and are projecting back to the entorhinal cortex. So place cells are undergoing all these changes in a novel environment. Now what happens to grid cells in a novel environment? When you put grid cells in a novel environment, what happens is transiently the responses the periodicity of the response of a grid cell changes. It expands. OK, so this is an example here is one of the, the periods, lambda 1, and green is lambda 2. These periods of the cell 1 have really changed, right? The ratio uh, of the period in the familiar environment versus the novel environment is far from 1. So it's stretched by even 1 and a half times. OK, it's a massive uh, rescaling of the response. And it can also be slightly anisotropic. OK, it's not just a global, simple rescaling. Now, that's also happening with the second cell, cell 2. Now, if you consider the ratios of these two parameters, okay, you can see that from the very first exposure, um, the ratios are nevertheless very close to one. Again, up to estimation of um, error. Okay, and the other thing also that changes is the gridness, the perfect crystallinity of the responses is considerably, re considerably reduced in the novel environments. Okay, and nevertheless, these ratios are preserved uh, quite close to one. What this is a plot of, this is actually the course of seven days of experiment, one, two, three, four, five, six here, and there's, um, there's one day that's missing because there were not enough cells. Um, over seven days, what happens is the periods gradually relax uh, back to the values that they had in the first familiar environment as this novel environment becomes more and more familiar. Okay, so the periods are gradually changing and relaxing. All this stuff is changing. The hippocampal place cells have completely remapped. But once again, the ratios um, are, are extremely similar. Oh. Yes. In the, new in the old environment, no, it remembers. And the period is, is, is back down again. That's right. That's right. So that was also done in these experiments. So, yes. Um, OK, then what happens to the relative phases? So once again, the relative phases um, between cells of pair, uh, uh, pairs of cells um, is, is exactly unchanged in the novel environment um, relative to what it was in the familiar environment. Okay, and that's true from the very first exposure to the novel environment. Okay, so there's an internal stabilization of the, of the relative um, phases of these cells and their grid parameters, um, independent of the other inputs to the system, at least the hippocampal inputs to the system um, in the novel environment, because those things, those inputs are changing extremely um, um, in, in an extreme way. And um, also the changes in, in hippocampal place cells uh, relax, but at slightly different time scales. Um, than these ones, okay? So they can't be really responsible for, um, for, for the stabilization of the, 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 the ratios of um, parameters or for the um, fact that the, um, that the relative phases do not change um, uh, relative to each other. Yeah? Uh, 
That's right. That's right. Uh, the cells that have different period um, sh cannot, right? So even in principle, it cannot be because um, uh, if you have uh, two periodic signals at different uh, frequency, their relative phase is processing all the time. So, right? So it's not possible. It's just not even possible. Yeah. Okay, so, um, all right. So I just need to see um, where I am on time. Um, Okay, 20 minutes left? Yeah, okay, so good. So I wanna just go um, uh, finish this, this story very quickly so I can get to the second story, which um, um, uh, is something I'm you know, quite excited about as well. Um, so, uh, so far I've discussed sort of the stability of these states, right, and the fact that it's not externally driven um, stability of the parameters, ratios, and the relative phases. Um, it's, it's, it's internally uh, determined. Um, so what about the continuity? Okay, so we saw that the relative phases are distributed uniformly on, over this unit, you know, one unit cell of, the, of this periodic uh, lattice. But um, in what, you know, is it, is it, is it the case that um, cells that have um, the exact same tuning curves, cells that are in phase, is it possible that they're grouped together and recurrently stabilizing each other? Uh, and cells with different relative phases are stabilizing each other but not interacting with cells with a different relative phase. So in other words, is it a set of discrete attractors, you know, finely spaced discrete attractors, or is it more like one continuous attractor, okay? So that's the question. So um, in other words, the question is, are these properties of stability and preservation of relative phase only true for groups of neurons that have basically the same relative phase, okay? Or, or is it true even for neurons that have disparate relative phase? Um, relative to each other. So to answer that question, we just looked at, you know, how similar are these parameter ratios between cells as a function of how different is their um, phase offset? Okay, and what we found is that the similarity of parameter ratios is completely independent of the degree of phase offset in the tuning curves of, of the pairs of neurons. Okay, we also found that the similarity of, of, uh, of these grid parameters across time, okay, when you wait, you know, how stable are these ratios across time when you revisit a familiar environment after several hours, um, it, it, the stability of those ratios um, is also independent of um, the, the phase separation in the response of pairs of cells. And finally, the relative stability of the, of the stability of the relative phase um, is independent of the relative phase itself, of the magnitude of the relative phase. So cells that are quite different in relative phase, okay, in their phases, have the same stability in their phase relationship as cells that have similar or identical phase. Okay, so this is um, um, sort of evidence um, in favor of um, the continuity of the manifold, which is that all cells are interacting and stabilizing each other even if they have um, distinct uh, phases. Okay, so parameter similarity, ratio stability, and phase stability are not clustered by relative phase similarity. Okay, and um, we, we also wanted to study um, a, a question about um, perturbations. So when there are perturbations to the system, and specifically if there are perturbations that knock the system off the two-dimensional manifold, does the system relax back to the two-dimensional manifold? We wanted to see if we could get at the dynamics of, 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 of the system and look for perturbations. So what we did is we parsed the whole trajectory. This is multicolored um, uh, picture is, this, is the trajectory of the animal as it runs around this box and we broke the trajectory into segments depending on whether the animal is mo moving in like the quadrant uh, that contained the eastward direction, the quadrant that contained um, you know, the V shape, this, this, this V that contained the west direction, this V that contained the north direction, this V that contained the east direction, and this V that contained um, uh, uh, the south direction. Okay, this is motion direction. This is not location of the animal but, but heading direction of the animal. So we parsed the trajectory, it's based on, um, on the motion direction and then color-coded, then computed all the relative phases between cells, and color-coded the relative phases only when, so, so this gray is the relative phases computed when, the, when we computed over the whole trajectory, and green is when you only compute the relative phase between cell, pairs of cells, only when the animal's moving in the northward direction, okay, versus when, only when the animal's moving in the southward direction. So you can see that in the animal, when you parse the trajectories by motion direction, there are actually small but significant shifts in the relative phase of pairs of cells. 
So now you're being knocked precisely off the manifold. Okay, these are changes off the manifold um, induced by motion or velocity of the animal in specific direction. And what we found is, um, so okay, so velocity inputs perturb the relative phase relationships and therefore they perturb the system off this two-dimensional manifold. Okay, and then if we were to um, analyze um, the time course of, 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 of these perturbations, then this is, um, this, is, this is the degree of perturbation of the system off the manifold. And what you can see is that for each of these directions, as you slide the window where we're looking and computing relative phase away from this um, segment of the trajectory that's only moving northward, and we slide it you know, further away from that northward segment so that you know, all directions of motion are represented here in the window that we've chosen, you can see that the system relaxes back um, to, the, to, the, to, to the on manifold um, point, which is you know, uh, close to this black line. Okay, and, um, and this is true for each of the directions. So the perturbation uh, uh, lasts for some duration and relaxes back. And the time scale here is about a second um, or two. And um, this time scale actually corresponds to just the, the, the correlation time for the motion of the animal. So it's just saying that when the perturbing input is removed, the perturbation itself goes away. So what we can say is that the, the relaxation time of the system back to the manifold is shorter than okay, um, the, 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 the cor correlation time for the animal motion. So we can say that much. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. That's right. Okay, that's a good question. So the question is, why should we count the velocity as a perturbation, right? So in the picture, we've got this two-dimensional manifold of fixed points, which represents different possible locations of the animal in this two-dimensional space, okay, or at least modulo the, the periodicity of the response. And now, the, now, if it's an integrator, the velocity input should come in and push the state along this two-dimensional manifold so that it represents the animal being at a different point. So the velocity signal should be parallel to the manifold, not perpendicular to it. Okay, so that's in an ideal world. Okay, this is an external input. Okay, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not, okay, so it's an external input, and there's no guarantee. So in an ideal world, the velocity input should have zero component perpendicular to the manifold. But it's not necessary that it will. Okay, so it's possible, and this is empirical. We're just saying that empirically, if you parse it by velocity, there is a component of the input that has a small component yeah, perpendicular to the manifold. The animal can, right? The fact it is because the fact that the grids, the fact, okay, the fact that the cell has a crystalline grid-like response is evidence that the animal is path integrating. In fact, the evidence is very empirical without any of my analysis. It doesn't require my analysis, right? You put the animal in a darkened room. The fact that the cell can continue to lay its spikes down at the locations of the peaks means that the animal is able to use self-motion to update the state of the system. And so, okay, but I, okay let's take these at the end because I, I, we can't, yeah. <laughs> All right, so, so let's, let's just um, briefly consider the implications of uh, what I've told you so far. So um, I think the grid cell system is just, has been um, a, a beautiful gift to, to theorists uh, because it's providing some specific evidence that the brain contains and computes with continuous attractors. Um, for, for some of these um, integration functions that it performs. Um, it uh, is actually, there's a raging controversy in the field of uh, grid cells about uh, possible mechanisms for what generates uh, grid cells. And there's a, there's a model uh, uh, based on temporal interference rather than these spatial pattern formations based on recurring connectivity. Um, and um, when these, 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 these models, um, when they model populations um, uh, so far do not, um, contain attractor dynamics, two-dimensional attractor dynamics in the population response, okay? So these models um, so far are inconsistent with the existing data, whereas um, the more uh, networks based on recurring connectivity and pattern formation um, are consistent with all of, all of the known data. Okay, and um, so uh, this analysis and these continuous attractor models raise um, various questions. How are the structural symmetries that are required for continuous pattern Continuous attractor dynamics, how are they formed and maintained? So this would be the topic of part three, but it's now clear I'm not going to get there. Um, <laughs> this is the question Daniel asked. Okay, temporal aspects of the code. Um, it turns out that these cells do not simply encode um, location by the density of spikes at a location. Um, there's information contained in the timing of spikes, and in fact, a fair amount of information contained in the timing of spikes. And um, it's a perennial question in neuroscience, and it's, it's very urgent, specifically in grid cells, because grid cells and place cells 
are the two cortical areas that have, you know, they're the two areas in the central nervous system that pr present some of the most compelling evidence uh, for, for information carried in precise spike timings. Okay, there's other evidence for information uh, contained in precise spike timings in the brain, but that tends to come from more the sensory periphery. Okay, so in the central nervous system, these are some of the best examples of spike timing carrying information. And the question is, are those temporal aspects of the code um, a sort of an independent channel of information and also an independent dynamical process? Or, or um, uh, as, as this kind of spike density or rate code? Um, or, is the, or is the fundamental uh, unit of computation temporal and this rate uh, code picture sort of just an approximation? And I don't think we know the answer to that at all. It's a very, very wide open question. Okay, and then another question just in general for neuroscience and data sets is, is it even possible to do model-free discovery of dynamical structure? Okay, and uh, like the example that I showed you um, was if you just took a time series of these grid cells and plotted their responses in state space, it would be very, very difficult to determine um, the dimensionality of the response. And um, it's just, it's very difficult to know how to filter out what is noise and what is signal in the responses. And in the grid cell system, we were actually fortunate to be able to do that. Okay, so I wanna now, I'm gonna neglect most questions until the end because I really wanna tell you about the coding theory um, part uh, of, of, of the work. Um, and um, the, the subtitle here is that um, qualitatively new codes capable of exponential rather than polynomial accuracy um, in the brain. Okay, so to give you a little bit of um, context, um, in everything that follows, I'm gonna <coughs> be considering a very specific view of, of coding in the brain. And, um, but it's also a prevalent view, and it's a prevalent view of static population codes. Okay, so in, the, in that view, um, neurons, uh, uh, for example, this white uh, neuron, um, ha have tuning curves, okay? So if you vary the stimulus, uh, or the variable that the neuron is representing, and then you plot the mean response of the neuron, you get some nice curve, and different neurons have different curves, and typically the curves are the same shape and they're shifted uh, relative to each other, okay? This is not that dissimilar from what you just already saw for, for grid cells, okay? So, um, uh, so neurons, in other words, then their mean responses are characterized by these tuning curves and conditioned on the mean responses, the spiking of each neuron, let's assume, is um, independent, okay? So, uh, you know, it's a stochastic process on, this, on top of this mean rate that's independent. Okay, and um, you know, adding certain um, correlations and things like that, some very common forms of correlation, will not qualitatively change um, any of the things I'm gonna tell you. Okay, so the, for example, the neural mechanism for such codes uh, for generating these kinds of beautiful shapes could be like the continuous attractor dynamics that we just uh, discussed. Okay, so, so um, now in these codes, uh, a stimulus is presented, okay, in, in, the, in this view of population coding, there's a stimulus presented, each neuron fires on average given by its tuning curves, um, okay, but each neuron's response is stochastic, so the response really is, um, you know, something variable. And then the aim is to reconstruct, using the spike counts from the neurons, is to reconstruct um, the, the stimulus that was presented, okay? And how well can you do that? Okay, so now if you uh, know the error bars for each of the cells and, and, and the variance in the spike counts, then you can reconstruct the angle theta with some error delta theta. Um, uh, and uh, the question is, how does delta theta scale with the number of neurons? that are involved in the code, okay? So now I already told you these neurons are independent and you know, they have fluctuations that are independent, so of course the more neurons you have, you know that the noise should um, go down. The estimate, the uncertainty in the estimate um, should go down. Okay, so that, that seems like the more neurons there are firing for each value of the variable, the smaller the total estimation error. So to be precise, um, we wanna know, like in this one specific case of this nice, nice bump-like code, um, an input is given, theta, it induces some uh, responses, some spikes in the neurons that are stochastic, and the aim is to reconstruct the estimate of theta, so you get theta hat, and the question is, um, what is the expected squared error of the estimate? Um, what is it in such codes? So the input is giving a rate, and then it plus on with that rate. Yeah, exactly, the input gives a rate, and the spikes are plus on with that rate, exactly, that's it. And the aim is to then reconstruct the value of the input. Okay, and what is the error of that, and how does it scale with n, the number of neurons that are involved? Okay, so there's some very you know, um, nice formalism, asymptotic formalism called um, uh, for Fisher information. So there's a quantity named Fisher information that tells you um, about, um, about uh, the concentration of your, 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 the, the accuracy of your estimate um, in the limit of large number of neurons. And in that limit, the Fisher information scales like n, okay? And the mean squared error uh, through the Kramer-Rabound scales like one over that Fisher information, so it scales like one over n. 
Okay, so you know that's not bad. It's um, you know you you increase the number of neurons and you get um, increasing gains in accuracy. That uh, accuracy or inverse mean squared error, which uh, grow uh, so the accuracy grows with them. Um, so you increase neurons and you can get better and better performance. Okay, so I'm going to refer to all codes, all neural codes that have this kind of um, uh, within the static population coding framework, um, I'm going to call them classical population codes if they have these polynomial gains in accuracy with them. Okay, n or n squared or n cubed, any of those I'm going to call them classical population codes. So what are examples of classical population codes in the brain? Well, here are the usual suspects, the same examples you saw earlier, uh, orientation tuning, neuron, neurons with orientation tuning. These are place cells, these are cells that have, um, you know, very unimodal bump responses in two-dimensional space. Okay, and these are again those ocular motor neurons that you saw earlier, those head direction cells. All of these cells have um, polynomial um, gains in accuracy as a function of the number of neurons under this population coding framework that I described to you. Okay, and so in general, most of the known codes in sensory periphery in the brain and the motor periphery and even many cognitive codes like these place cells and head direction cells are both kind of more cognitive, they're not direct sensory codes. Are, are classical population codes. They have this polynomial growth of accuracy um, with, um, with, uh, with neuron number. Okay, so now the question we can ask is, is this really the best use, right? We're putting in more neurons and we're getting gains in accuracy, right? That seems all right, but we wanna know whether we're getting the best gain in accuracy that we can get for that number of neurons, okay? Is this the best use of neural currency? Okay, so before I give you the answer, just to sort of hint at the answer, um, I want to introduce a quantity called information rate. This is not rate as in rate in time, um, but it's actually um, it, it's, it's, uh, telling you how much information, real useful information in bits uh, about the stimulus as the code convey, uh, uh, divided by the total number of bits that, are, that, that, are, you know, that the code is capable of, okay, or that it, that it uh, transmits. Okay, so the information rate is a ratio of mutual information in this case. Um, oh, so if you have neurons that are spiking, you know, they have one or zero um, uh, response, they spike or don't spike, then the, the total number of bits scales like n, and the mutual information, um, which scales like a log of the Fisher information, okay, um, in these codes, um, it, it goes like log of n divided by n, and so in the limit of large n, this ratio, this information rate, is actually zero. Okay, so now, so, so, okay, so what have we got? So we've got that um, uh, you get a linear decrease in squared error with a linear decrease in information rate. And asymptotically, both go to zero. Okay, and um, then, uh, you know, is that, is that what you're gonna do? Is that the hit you have to take? So every time you want your error to go to zero, do you have to deal with the zero information rate? Is that a given? Okay. Then, um, when the error goes to zero, yeah. and that means that you can uh, estimate what you have on the other side with any precision you want. That's right. So, But the, but but the information see. rate has gone to zero. It's probably really inefficient. So, it's an efficiency. It's, it's an efficiency. Right. right? So your efficiency has gone to zero. Right? So for each oh. bit you're transmitting, if you want to transmit one bit with perfect fidelity, you have to transmit infinitely many bits before you can get the one bit with infinite precision. Right? That's basically what it says. <laughs> I mean, so, how you define the uh, quantity is like what uh, measurable is the error, and the error goes to zero. And yeah, but the question is how efficiently are you sending the error to zero? I mean, I could, I so could. Efficiency is the common value bound, right? If you hit that bound, then that you're as efficient as you can get. No, so so that's uh no, that's the point. That's not the case. Okay, so that's what and I'm asking. I'm asking this question. I'm saying, is it necessary that? As your error rate goes to zero, your error goes to zero, the mean squared error goes to zero, is it necessary that this information rate must go to zero too? That's the question I'm asking. Okay, and, and I think your, your question is a good one because um, you know, before 1948, everybody believed, everybody believed that has to happen, right? Information rate has to go to zero as, as you, um, you know, get more and more accurate. You, know, you, you, you have to just put in more and more, um, even neurons aside, right? This has nothing to do with neurons. Um, if you want to get more and more accurate, and, uh, you have to just put in more and more resources to be able to um, uh, do it until your information rate goes to zero. Okay, but then of course, you know, Shannon comes along and he proves, you know, it's still astonishing to me, but um, he, he, he proved that it was actually possible to um, get uh, the following, right? So he proved that it's possible to achieve an asymptotically <coughs> zero error rate at an asymptotically finite information rate. Okay, so so the information rate can be fixed at a finite value and nevertheless 
you can get asymptotically zero information. Okay, uh, error rate. This is for discrete variables. So what's the analog, what, what's the corresponding statement for analog variables? The corresponding statement for analog variables is that it should be possible to achieve exponentially vanishing error, okay, um, at an asymptotically finite information rate. So that's the bound, okay, that's the theoretical bound. Is it should be exponentially fast, the error should go to zero, uh, even as the information rate is finite. Okay, and so, um, so, that, so that's a statement. And um, the question is, does the brain contain such codes, right? I just told you that all these classical population codes do not achieve that, okay? So is there any example in the brain? I wouldn't be standing here uh, telling you about this part of the story if, if the answer was there isn't, okay? So what I'm gonna tell you is I'm gonna make the case of the grid cell code is, um, has this, this asymptotic scaling, okay? That's um, theoretically optimal. Okay, so let's formalize. So let's first consider that back to one population, okay, one network, one set of cells that have the same period. Okay, and let's just consider 1D. So here's a one-dimensional line. This is the variable X. Here's the animal. Okay, here's cell one, cell two, cell three. They have exactly the same tuning curves that are periodic. The blue cell is periodic. Um, and they're just shifts of one another. Now, depending on which cell is active and, and so on, you, you can tell exactly what phase the animal is at in, in space, but you can't tell where it is, right, which unit cell it's in, okay, because it's periodic. So in other words, given x, the animal's location x, the code of all the neurons in one group, the, the only thing that they're conveying to you is they're telling you about the remainder after uh, division by lambda, uh, uh, you know, what's, what's the modulo remainder. Okay, so you get x mod lambda, and to make it a phase, I'm just gonna divide by lambda. So now I get something that's between zero and one. So that's what one whole, one grid network only tells you this periodic phase. Okay, that's all you get. Okay, now we discussed earlier that uh, the grid cell system contains um, a set of discrete periods. Okay, so there's a, there's a set of lambdas um, that, that range from a third of a meter or so to three meters. And um, all these scales, these lengths are much smaller than the relevant length scales that the animal cares about. And so if they are n such distinct periods, they're actually n such distinct phases. So for each period, spatial period lambda, lambda 1 lambda up to lambda n, you get n phases, and you get um, x mod lambda 1 over lambda 1 up to x mod lambda n over lambda n. So this is this n-dimensional phase, okay? So a set of n phases that is coding one scalar quantity x. Okay, that's what you've got. So this seems very, very bizarre, because it's like walking into a room. You walk into a room, you want to know the time. Instead of finding a single 12-hour clock on the wall, what you find is you find a wall full of clocks each of which has, ha which has um, a different period, and all the periods are very short compared to the time of day. This is nine minutes, 10 minutes, 11 minutes, and so on, okay? So you want to tile the time in a 12 or 24 hour day, and you come upon a wall of clocks with these short periods that are all different from one another. So what's the utility of such a code? Okay, so here's the utility of the code. It, it has some extremely interesting um, mathematical structure. Okay, so this code allows for unique representation of exponentially large ranges of locations. So let's first consider the case of no noise, then we'll include noise. Okay, so in the absence of any noise, um, what happens? Okay, so what happens is, as, as, so the, the code, it's n periodic variables, right? These n phases, so it's actually an n-dimensional torus. My limited artistic abilities means that I can only show you this one, a 2D torus. Okay, as x goes from zero up to um, um, some, you know, it increases upward, then what happens is that this, um, the, the coding line is wrapping through onto this torus. And it's wrapping at different rates along the, the different dimensions of the torus, okay? Because the periods are different. So it's wrapping at different rates. So what it does is that these periods are in some sense incommensurate. They're just generically chosen periods, lambdas. Um, the line doesn't repeat on itself after one loop, okay? It misses just by a little bit, and then it keeps going, and it keeps going, and it keeps going, and if we consider that you know, the line has, you have finite resolution, okay? So there's only finite, there's no such thing as a real number in the real world, right? Everything's finite resolution, so the line has a certain width, it's a pasta noodle, it's a, it's a spaghetti, it's not a, it's not a line, it's spaghetti. Okay, so for a given finite width, at some point as you keep going, this is actually a space filling curve, and for a finite width, it will eventually fill space um, with, a, with a scaling like this, okay? So the, the range uh, of, of distance x that can be traveled, traversed before the space is filled with a finite width, um, it has a prefactor lambda, which is like the rough scale of each of these periods, okay? It's about the same order of magnitude for all the periods, 
And you've got n in the exponent, okay? So it scales exponentially in the number of, um, of different distinct periods. Okay, and beta is a prefactor that's smaller than one. It depends on the width of that Poisson rule. This is now the n-dimensional. This is the n-dimensional, that's right, that's right. Okay, and this is noise-free. So now what happens if I introduce noise into the system? Okay, so now I've got, I've got a coding range that's exponentially large in the number of distinct periods. Okay, it's unique representation. Okay, so now I want to use this. Okay, so, so suppose we are representing x. So there's some location x naught. You represent that as, um, you know, these phases, this n-dimensional phase vector. And let's add a little bit of noise to each of the phases, a tiny bit of noise, right? This is of order one, each of these phases. And here the noise is extremely small, 0.05 standard deviation noise. And now you attempt to, to decode, okay, x hat from that noise. What is it that you get? The, the distribution of guesses um, are shown in black. So you can see that the errors are extremely large, okay? And it's because of this very interleaving characteristic of this code, because it's space filling, and you're always filling the interspecies, so the errors are extremely large. So this seems awful. And this is the comparison with the classical population code. It's a very local estimate of the, er the, the errors are very local. But with the black curve, the errors are all over the place. And keep in mind that because R is exponentially large, these errors are very big indeed, okay? So small, tiny errors in phase mean a huge decoding error in the estimate. So that doesn't seem very nice. But what becomes beautiful is if you restrict the, 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 the range over which location is encoded and decoded to a much smaller value than the full range R that's possible with a finite width pasta noodle, okay, then um, even though that, that new range is exponentially large, then suddenly the estimation errors collapse. Okay, So this is a black curve here which is the estimation errors with this grid cell code compared to the classical population code. And the black peak is much narrower than the, than the green peak. Okay, and the information rate of this code is just given by, the, by this value rho, which tells you how much smaller the, the prefactor is in the exponent. Okay, so that can be kept finite. It can be a half. Okay, and as long as it's a half, you can get these huge gains in the accuracy of the code. Okay, so the, the variance uh, of the estimate of location from a grid cell-like code divided by the variance of the estimate from a classical population code is exponentially small in the number of distinct periods, um, n, that are used. Okay, so, so that is qualitatively a new class of code in the presence of noise. Okay, so exponentially better estimation accuracy than classical population codes at any finite information rate row. No, everything is continuous here. Everything is perfectly analog. There's nothing is discrete. This is an analog code. Each of the phases is analog. Yeah, let me just finish, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna summarize. So I just have two more slides to go and then I'll sum up. Okay, so what is the reason uh, for this big advantage of this, this grid cell code compared to the classical population code? Really, what's the high level idea why this is so much better? Okay, and I can summarize that in just a couple of slides and then I, I'll conclude. So the statement is that classical, the classical population code, we, we talked about how you know, the single bump-like codes are like this low dimensional manifold in this high dimensional neural activity space. So if they're MN neurons, MN total neurons, okay, um, then this is an MN dimensional space and if there's a one dimensional variable that's represented, it's just, um, it's just one uh, ring that's, uh, that's embedded in this N dimensional space. Now, if um, there are errors, so each neuron has some noise, right? Some Poisson noise, so the errors are represented by this red ball, okay? And they're a property of single neurons, okay? So it has some unit diameter. So the ball radius is fixed, and it depends on just, it's just it, it doesn't scale with number of neurons. It's just, you know, the, the, the noise in individual neurons. Um, now, what is the length of, so the fractional error that's induced, okay? So any perpendicular components of this red ball are corrected back to the green line, but the components along the green line remain, okay? That's the error, the residual error of the code. And the fractional error from this, this noise is, uh, is just the length of this dark red segment compared to the total length of this coding line, okay? And the coding line scales like, um, the length of this coding line scales like root n, root mn, because the diagonal of an mn dimensional cube is like, uh, has length of root mn. So this, this, this circle, this coding line, has length root mn, so therefore the fractional error induced by um, noise in the neural response is, goes like one over root mn. That's the geometric picture for why all these classical population codes have the scaling of uh, a root mean squared error of like one over mn. It's just the geometric picture, it's so simple. Now what's happening with the grid cell code, okay, it's also an embedding of a low dimensional line in a high dimensional space, 
Um, but it's a much more dense embedding of this line in this n-dimensional space. So it's, it's, a, it's a line of length exponentially long. So once again, the noise ball is the same fixed radius because it's a single neuron property. But the line, the length of the coding line scales like e to the rho beta n, where rho is the information rate. OK, so the fractional error, again, the ball radius is fixed, so the fractional error just scales like 1 over the coding line length. So the fractional error is like e to the minus rho beta n. OK, so, so that's conceptually, that's it. OK, that's the reason why the grid cell code is it just takes the variable to be coded and stretches it into this long um, line. And then the fractional errors that are induced are extremely small. Okay, so it's just a very efficient packing of a line in a high dimensional space. So just to um, just um, uh, get to this, the summary, um, the questions are, does the brain exploit the full potential of the grid cell code? We don't know. So we need predictions to test this possibility. It's uh, lines of work and uh, network models of decoding and inference. Mathematically, um, there's some very interesting parallels to um, um, uh, number systems. Uh, this is a residue number system code um, the, for discrete variables, uh, integers. If x were integer and lambdas were integer and co-prime, then um, it, the Chinese remainder theorem tells you how to decode from given the phase, how do you decode to x. But these are all real numbers, so we need the mathematics to understand how to do these kinds of decodings on real um, numbers. And so here's the, the summary. Okay, So the summary is that the grid code is, I think, the first known example of an analog exponentially strong population code in the brain. Um, it stores metric information and actually allows metric updates of a, of a metric variable, location and distances. Okay, um, The exponential scaling is a signature of strong error correcting analog codes. And perhaps it could be used as a new benchmark uh, in talking about efficiency of neural redundancy. How efficient is the redundancy that's in a system? Um, the emphasis on a geometric viewpoint of neural coding, like looking at this high level geometric picture of the codes as embeddings in the high dimensional space, it's standard information theory. We don't use it as much in neuroscience. So I would say that this kind of emphasis really helps us get the, the more abstract view of what codes are doing and rather than the algebraic methods that we use of computing Fisher information, which are very inefficient, I think. And um, I think the mathematics of packings of manifolds into high dimensional spaces to construct good codes, analog codes, is really an um, area of future research that um, could really use a lot of interactions between information theory, mathematics, and neuroscience. And finally, I want to just make the statement that Shannon should be introduced to Lyapunov. Um, <laughs> Um, because neural codes are generated from neural dynamics. And the code that is used to represent information in a, in a, in a neural system, um, it, the choice of code constrains the dynamical evolution of the system. And so we need a theory that really you know, integrates coding and dynamics, um, especially when we're talking about memory systems that involve you know, coding and incrementing um, over time. OK, so I'll just um, end on my acknowledgment slides. Thank you. That was the, the part that I couldn't get to, the third part of the story, but I'm glad I got to it too. Um, so thank you very much. These are the four people from my group who did the work. These are my collaborators, and thank you all.